On today's episode of Watch Jargo, what is an immobilizer? And also, how do you get rid of those things? We are here to talk about immobilizers, vehicle immobilizers, because I've been working on Cheap Jeep, and as you guys saw yesterday, the Sentry key system will not let me start the car. A car that belongs to me. So what is an immobilizer? Well, an immobilizer is something that prevents the car from being started without a signal or the correct key for the vehicle. And they've been around for a very, very long time. Actually, the first immobilizer was invented in 1919, and it interrupted the magneto. A magneto is a pretty crazy thing to interrupt, but they wanted to prevent cars from being stolen back then, so they came up with an immobilizer. And from then on, immobilizers have taken many, many different forms. Everything from a key fob where you go through a certain number of button presses, actually modern Harleys, Ferraris, older Ferraris use systems like that, to the incredibly simple systems like we have in every new smart key where uh, it just verifies that you got the right key. As soon as you push the button, a little radio conversation happens and hey, the car can start. But it wasn't always magic, which, you know, it's extremely complex, but it seems super simple magic. People have been building their own immobilizers at home forever. Just a switch on the ignition wire is usually all you need. If you cut power to the coil, car doesn't run anymore. And if that switch is hidden, it's kind of an immobilizer. You could do the same thing with an electric fuel pump, cut the fuel. Uh, lots of cars actually have the ECU just shut off the fuel pump and the ignition. That's all you need to do. Car won't run anymore, even if it, it can crank all day. So other than the extremely simple side, like just a toggle switch, or the extremely complex side, like modern smart keys, I wanted to talk about immobilizer systems in general and how you get rid of these things because for the most part, they're not stopping thieves. That's, I don't think it's a secret here. If a thief wants something, they're taking it from you no matter what. Now it's a little bit of a deterrent, but it's an ideology of deterrence. It's not really like a, a true deterrent. It just kind of makes thieves think, that thing's kind of hard to steal. I don't want to do it. Car thefts are crimes of opportunity if it's too difficult, they're not gonna do it. Now we've all seen that smart keys can be tricked with just a transponder setup. One person walks over to the house with another radio and it transmits to another radio that's in the car and they hit the unlock button and they drive away with your car and the car sits there with the key not found on the ignition after that. And it doesn't matter, they got the car and it took seconds. So even in 2021, immobilizers haven't really solved anything if the thief is determined enough. But I have a few generations of immobilizers here to show you guys and I wanted to talk to you about each one. So this here is one of the earliest ones I started with other than the old toggle switch systems. Back in the day, it was a pretty traditional key, but the next step is adding some layer of electronic protection to the key. This is my 1994 Camaro. It's the GM VATS system, and the VATS system puts a pill in every key. Now, back in the day, people were running around talking about how they had computer chips in their keys and it was smart and nobody could copy them. And it kind of created some of this theft-proof ideology. The thieves didn't care, the techs didn't care. They all knew how this system actually worked and it's incredibly simple. So, we have a key here. It's a normal GM square key, which is an ignition key. If you guys, I mean, you remember when cars had a round key for the door and a square key for the ignition, but there's this pill on here. You see that thing. It has two contacts, one on each side. And in the ignition, it has two contacts, one on each side. The key goes between those and it picks up that pill. And people thought it was some type of chip and this chip would talk to the computer. This is in the 90s. These things were too simple back then. This is a resistor. There's only 14 values for the resistor. So a locksmith or a thief could literally order all 14 keys. They were about a dollar each. Uh, nothing crazy back in the day. And then you could just cut the key onto it and you were good to go as long as the resistance matches. And it's so easy, actually I'll show you right now. You can measure the resistance with a multimeter and you know what you need. All right, here's our meter. It's auto ranging, here's our key. We'll put the key on that meter lead right there. And here's the other side of the resistor. And we have 1.1 kilo ohms. Now there's a super simple chart, which has uh, 14 numbers, one through 14, and they correspond to all the different resistance values. And you just order the key with that number on it. That's how simple it is to solve VATS. Now, it's a nightmare because as you would imagine, 
cars get driven a lot. The key gets inserted in the ignition, used, wiggled around, dirt gets in the cylinder, the key gets dirty, the contacts get worn out, these things fail and it creates a bunch of problems. All of a sudden you've got your car with a security light on, you're sitting in a parking lot looking like an idiot for 10 to 30 minutes while you wait for the thing to reset so you can drive your car home. Uh, if I remember right, you can always get around this one by turning the ignition on, even if the resistance isn't right, and waiting for 10 to 30 minutes, one of the two, and the car will start and let you drive home. So it didn't take terribly long for the next generation of immobilizers and theft deterrents like this. Next up, they put an RFID chip basically in the key. It's a transceiver, it's a little pill usually, and it's sitting on there, maybe stuck to the key itself. Then they surround that with the plastic shroud of the key and there's a transceiver shoved in there. These are actually chip keys. This was supposed to be state of the art, stop all the thefts and solve all of the mechanical failures of the old systems like that. Of course, Chrysler calls this skim or century key immobilizer and there, there are just a bunch of different versions of the exact same thing. Everybody did it for the most part. But this created a problem. While those older VAT style keys and regular keys were simple to copy, this is incredibly hard to copy for a normal locksmith. I mean, they have a lot of time to try to catch up on the technology. As a home user, somebody working on a car, you can't fix your own car anymore. It's a huge nightmare and people will charge up to like 150 plus dollars for a key like this, which is horrible because we all know that this, there's nothing special about this. It's worth one dollar, but they're just charging you a ton of money because they added an hour, maybe two hours of labor to this key. But anyway, how it works, there's an antenna around the ignition, in the ignition, something like that. It's just like a, a ring antenna. That's exactly what skims is. The key goes in, it sits like right there. That antenna is also outputting a little bit of power. It powers up that transceiver in the key. The key responds with its code and everything says, I'm good to go, you can start, or I'm not good to go, you can't start. And that's exactly what's happening on my Jeep. This is a factory key with tons of wear on it. You can tell that it's an original key. It says Chrysler on it and everything, and it will not let this thing start. So let's talk about the newest technology and then move on to fixing it. The newest technology is absolutely awesome. This is a two-way remote start key, which is incredible. We used to spend thousands of dollars to have a remote start or even just alarm system of this caliber. Obviously we all wanted the LCDs, we wanted that one to two mile range so we could see if the car's alarm was going off or if something was wrong. Now it's literally in the factory key and we're paying like 300 bucks for this. I'm happy with this. This is an incredibly consumer friendly key. Sure it costs you 300 bucks, but it's worth something. Like this is not junk. This is a $1 piece of junk that they're out here trying to charge $150 for. That is the problem. This is not the problem. This is everything that we ask for as consumers shoved into a great package that holds up forever. It's honestly better than the old remote start systems. I mean, it's two way. Look, truck starts, light flashes green. If the truck doesn't start, light flashes red. How cool is that? Push it again and yep, red light, truck shut down. I could not ask for more out of the new keys and everybody's done it at this point the BMW smart key, almost everything has remote start and they're all getting close to being two way. This is how the technology should be. Nothing's gonna stop the thieves. They're gonna take what they want, but at least this is consumer friendly and uh, you're getting some value out of your money. So now you've got a car with an immobilizer or some kind of anti-theft system. You need to get rid of it. For whatever reason, a lot of it uh, is LS swaps or, or just the fact that the key's not working. If you have HP tuners and you have a modern GM ECU, it's gonna cost you credits. Plug in your interface and delete pats, bats, whatever it is, and you're good to go. On the LT1 stuff, obviously like the 94, it's a little bit harder. You need older software, and that older software is typically not very good, but you can get it done, and you can get it done cheap. Vats deletes are pretty reasonable. All the GM ECU deletes are very reasonable. In fact, J&J &J Auto Wrecking, where I get most of my LS swaps, they do it before they ship you the engine. They plug in HP tuners while it's still in the car and delete the immobilizer for you because you're probably not ever gonna use those keys. All you wanna do is send a crank signal and power on the ECU and watch the magic happen. That's how it should be. Well, that enables you to do exactly that. And there's plenty of software out there to help you accomplish that. But the skim setup in this Grand Cherokee has fought me and fought me and fought me. But today I happen to have its four digit pin and we're gonna to try to program this key to the ECU. And if that doesn't work, we're gonna delete skims and solve this problem for everybody else down the road that should 
absolutely be able to use a cheap key. Uh, that's kind of what Right to Repair is all about, being able to fix the car yourself, and it should not cost you $150 for a $1 repair. You should be able to just run down to the hardware store, grab a key blank, cut it, and drive your car the way you want. And for anyone thinking I'm helping out thieves, I promise I'm not. Like I said, they go for crimes of opportunity. They're not gonna spend a bunch of time cloning your key and going through all this work. I'm sure it happens, but it's not for a few thousand dollar Jeep. It's for a car that's worth their time to steal. So yesterday I spent hours and hours and hours troubleshooting this thing, trying to get the four digit pin out of this thing that allows you to start secure access mode and program a key back. And all I'm trying to put in here is the factory key. Like I said, this should be working all along. Now, I don't care how this works. I don't care if I delete skim or if I get this key programmed, I just want the car to run. Skim working or not won't make a lick of difference to the next person. And if it doesn't work, it's probably better for them anyway. They get value for their money again. So I tried to run an app called Chrysler Pin Puller. Now that's on the Android app store only because Apple locks down their Bluetooth pretty well and Android allows kind of everybody to do everything. Uh, so my Elm 327 module, it's a Wi-Fi one. It would not work with BlueStacks running Android on the laptop. I installed the app on BlueStacks and tried to emulate Android and go through all this work. It wouldn't work. So you need a Bluetooth Elm 327 for that, according to them. Today, we're going back to my Autel MS909 and we're gonna try to use that and the pin that I have acquired in a way that you typically cannot acquire it. I would say I've read a couple hundred threads on just skim last night trying to troubleshoot this, and there was not a dealer in North America that would let anybody have the pin. Well, that's how I got the pin, but if you don't have it, an Autel IM series, the key programming one, will allow you to pull it. It's literally in the ECU, and if you just have the right software, you can pull the pin right out. So uh, you can use the Chrysler Pin Puller app, or you can use an Autel, uh, and there are a few other key and diagnostic tools that will allow you to pull that out of there and use the car the way you should be able to. So to do this on the Jeep factory tool or on your Autel, you go to control unit and body and SKM. It also has skim and a whole bunch of other things in parentheses and special function, program ignition keys and okay, and then put the pin in. Uh, hopefully the pin's correct. If you put it in three times wrong, it will lock everything out. It now says learned key and ignition. Press OK or cancel to exit programming keys. Escape. That did not work. And now I can finally get back into the immobilizer after that battery pull and let's run powertrain control module replaced again put the pin in yes yes okay pin is accurate okay update with present vin yes vin write was successful secret key transferring successful cycle the ignition key Well, I knew it was gonna do that. I didn't want it to send the secret key. Well, there you have it. After tons more work, I still cannot get this thing to start right. I've done PCM replacement. That didn't work. I've programmed ignition keys. That didn't work. I've cleared all the ignition keys. That seemed like it worked. And then reprogrammed the ignition keys. Still does not work. And this is all with the factory pin code. Of course, it confirms that and it tells me the pin is valid. And then it just goes on to not work. So it must be a bad skim module or maybe an issue with this specific key or maybe it's some weird thing on the CAN bus, which I don't believe at all because it talks to the skim module and if there was a problem with the CAN bus, that would fail. But we'll try this one more time. This is about try 50 tonight. She's dead, Jim. Anyway. More troubleshooting on that later. Now you guys know what an immobilizer is, uh, why they're terrible, and at least an idea of what you can do to get rid of them. For this, uh, you can just hop online and order a new computer that doesn't have skim enabled, and then you unplug this thing right here. It's the connector for the skim module right under the steering wheel. Okay, usually I can unplug it in one second. You unplug it, tape it off, make sure it never gets plugged in again, stick your new ECU in, turn the key, and you're good forever. If you ever plug that module in, it programs itself to the ECU 
and you're out of luck again. So be careful if you do buy a new ECU to solve the problem. And some of you are thinking, tune it out with HP tuners. It works on all the GM and Ford stuff. It only works on Chrysler products if the Chrysler product is a 2008 plus Dodge Viper. HP Tuners has been very clear about that on the forums. There's tons and tons of threads about trying to delete it. You can't, unless you have a, a very expensive Viper, not an old cheap one, a very expensive Viper. So uh, it's not gonna help you at all on any of these older things that people wanna be tuning, like neons and maybe your Jeep and who knows. So again, the immobilizer is simply there to try to keep people from making a $1 copy of a key and having your car on the road because they had access to your key. But if they had access to their, your key, I mean, they probably have an easy way to steal the car anyway. What it really ends up doing is causing major problems like this. In fact, huge problems to the WJ. There are thousands and thousands of threads about this exact issue on a WJ on the internet. And also it makes it really expensive for you to get copies of your own keys. So that is it for today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to head on over to shopwatchjr.com for cool shirts, not like this. And please like, share, subscribe, do whatever you wanna do. And I will talk to you next time. No winning on the old Jeep. Oh well, I knocked out a bunch of other stuff and needed done. Headlights and uh, oil cap. Uh, the only thing that's left is the oil dipstick. That broke, the little yellow plastic broke off of it. Not the trans dipstick here, but uh, that's on the way. It'll be here in the morning. The passenger side light should be wrapped up. I just hooked the battery back up. Of course, O'Reilly's had an oil cap in stock, so we are good to go over here too. Yeah, much better. Throw this old half of an oil cap away. And let's test out the lights. I think that looks better with the amber. I like how it kind of white fades into amber there. And signals. There's one. I don't know why, but the low beam isn't coming on.